Great. So, hi everyone. I'm Nagada Dorn. I'm a second year medical student, and I'm super excited to be giving you my first class session today on metabolism and glycolysis. Now, before we begin, first of all, um, congratulations on being done with CVP. I really hope it went well for all of you, inshallah. And if not, don't worry, inshallah, you'll do a lot better in the upcoming finals and the next semester. Now, uh, before again, before we begin, you can ask me any questions at any time. You can stop me. Uh, we will have little checkpoints for any questions that you need to ask. And yeah, just feel free. And one more thing is that I understand you guys must be tired. It's been a long day and it's 8 p.m. But if you would like to interact, that would be really nice. And it would make this session even more fun for all of us. Okay, so let's begin. So this pal actually covers three of your more lectures, uh, Introduction to Metabolism, Glycolysis, and Glycolysis II. So inshallah, you'll be able to cover all of the, all three of these lectures in one pal. So let's get started. Um, now, before we dive deep into all the concepts, I want you to look at these images. So this person that is moving, the, your DNA, the synthesis of your DNA, your, your neurons firing, this process is going on inside your cells. What drives these processes? What do you guys think drives us? What is give, allowing us to carry all these things out as well as everything else? Energy. Exactly, energy. So in what form? ATP. Exactly. So what drives us is energy and in the form of ATP, most commonly in our body. So to do a little quick refresher of ATP, I'm sure you guys already know what that is. Um, ATP is adenosine triphosphate. It is the primary energy currency of the body, and it consists of a phosphorylated, phosphorylated nucleotide. So here's the structure right here. You have uh, a nucleotide, which consists of the ribose sugar and the nitrogenous base or adenine. And that is phosphorylated with these three phosphates. I'm gonna try to see if I can have a pointer. Uh, I don't think I can. Anyways, so these three phosphate groups right there are what allows it to be an energy currency because energy is stored in those bonds between those phosphates. So what would release this energy? What do you guys think would release the energy? Mitochondria. Well, sort of. Mitochondria is where it happens, where this release of energy happens. So you're correct. But the process is just the breaking of those bonds. So when those bonds are broken, the energy is released. And that is how ATP is a provider of energy. And so when these bonds are broken, so when we get rid of one of the phosphates, it goes from adenosine triphosphate to adenosine diphosphate or ADP. And also when ADP loses another phosphate, it will become AMP or adenosine monophosphate. So when you break down ATP for energy, you get ADP and phosphate. Okay, now one thing to understand, obviously ATP is constantly being consumed by the processes that I just mentioned earlier on with the movement and the neurons and everything. But ATP is also obviously being regenerated. So there's this balance between them where ATP is consumed or used up and regenerated. So it's used, uh, it's consumed by a process of hydrolysis. So that is what gets rid of that phosphate, as you can see in the diagram. And it is regenerated by re-adding that phosphate that it lost. It's a very simple process. Now it's consumed again in processes like muscle contraction, um, active transport in membranes. I'm sure you guys already know these things. And it is regenerated by processes which add the phosphate back. And we will talk about these processes more uh, later on. OK, so what we call the reactions which consume energy or break down energy or use up the ATP, we call them anabolic reactions. And the reactions which regenerate the ATP, we call them catabolic reactions. And we will dive deeper into them. This is an introduction. So all this ATP that we're talking about, where does it come from? And one of you already mentioned it, which is mitochondria, a 
one of the one of the sites where ATP is made, but the actual processes which create ATP is called cellular respiration or metabolism. So cellular respiration is a subset or a part of metabolism which produces ATP in cells. Now this diagram here is a very simplified little diagram. We have a cell up right there and you don't need to worry about it. It's just a it's just a little picture. But cellular respiration just consists of the processes by which ATP is created. So here we have a cell and cell cellular respiration takes several steps or several pathways and there are so many um, reactions and, and enzymes and pathways to consider. So the big picture here is that it's happening in the cell and it's producing energy. Now it, it starts with glycolysis, which by this diagram, which part of the cell does glycolysis happen in? Can anyone tell me? Cytoplasm. Yes, the cytoplasm, perfect. And then it goes on to the Krebs cycle, which and the and then the electron transport chain, which by the diagram happen in mitochondria. The mitochondria, perfect. So in this lecture, we're again, I'm gonna be teaching you glycolysis, not the rest of this, but the upcoming PAL sessions will be on Krebs cycle and then the electron transport chain. So this is where we start, right? Now, before we get into glycolysis, there are some things that we need to understand, some basic concepts, the basic definitions, um, the core of cellular respiration. Before we begin with glycolysis, we need to understand the process of metabolism in general. So this is gonna be a basic uh, uh, overview of your lecture, introduction to metabolism. Okay, so we have two metabolic activities that the cells undergo. So we have catabolism and anabolism. Now, the opposite of each other, catabolism is where there are degrada degradative processes that produce energy. So you're degrading molecules. And if you look at this uh, diagram in the middle here, you have at the top energy yielding nutrients, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. So you're degrading these molecules to produce ATP or energy, which is signified by chemical energy in the form of ATP right here. And so this consists of, again, breaking down carbohydrates to glucose, breaking down fats to fatty acids, breaking down proteins, to amino acids, all of these things um, which yield ATP. This, these processes are called catabolic reactions or catabolism. Here you have another diagram showing you a molecule being broken down to another molecule and ATP. Now, anabolism is opposite. So if catabolism was producing energy, anabolism is going to be consuming that energy. So the kind of reactions which, which consume energy are biosynthetic processes. So synthetic, meaning you're synthesizing something, you're creating a molecule. So it's the opposite of catabolism, where you're taking the simpler molecules like amino acids and glucose, fatty acids, and you are building them up or synthesizing the macromolecules or complex molecules like proteins and polysaccharides and lipids. So these two processes are opposites of each other. Now, one of my favorite sayings, um, catabolism and anabolism are perfectly balanced as all things should be. So there is a balance in our body between catabolism and anabolism. So you don't end up breaking down all of your sugars you are also creating your sugar so that there's a balance and each process happens when it is needed. So um, all biosynthetic reactions of macromolecules like making sugars, making proteins, making lipids, it is also balanced by their degradation. That is how our body, how our body maintains a balance. All right. Now, one more thing to note is that different nutrients like glucose, amino acids, and lipids, they can be interconverted with each other. So it's not just that glucose makes a glycogen or uh, uh, the complex molecule of glucose, but you can also make um, glucose from amino acids and you can make fatty acids from glucose. So there's a lot of overlap. Now you don't have to worry about this diagram too much. It was in your lecture, but just focus on what I highlighted, which is the main point that you can interconvert glucose and amino acids and fatty acids and all of that. There's uh, overlap between them. Now, when a nutrient enters the cell, it has two paths that it can take. So by a nutrient, I mean like a sugar, glucose, amino acid, protein, whatever it is. 
Once it enters the cell, it has two paths. As we just mentioned, this is again reiterating that it can either be incorporated into a cellular mo macromolecule or it can be oxidized for its ATP re regeneration. So in being incorporated into a cellular macro macromolecule, what kind of process is that that we just described? Anabolism. Yes. And so the opposite process would be catabolism. Perfect. Okay. Now, this uh, is a simplified way of describing this diagram, which was in your slide, which again, you, slides, you don't need to worry about this whole process. Just this is the main point that the nutrient can either go undergo anabolism or catabolism, depending on what the cell needs from it. So if the cell needs energy, then obviously the nutrient will undergo catabolism and be oxidized to produce energy. But if the cell has enough energy and it needs to start storing things, then it will undergo anabolism. Is this clear? Any questions so far? No. Okay. Thank you. Now, for catabolism, we said, okay, it's oxidized for ATP generation, but how exactly is this done? Or what is the process that is happening here? This process, we call it fuel oxidation. So what is fuel oxidation? Um, now before, now I know these reactions are reminding me of high, reminding you of high school chemistry and it's like, what is going on here? But don't worry about it. Um, fuel simply means one of the macromolecules or no, not macromolecules, one of the substrates or nutrients that our body uses to produce uh, ATP or energy. So that could, anything that is in the food that you eat, that you eat. so it's like glucose or uh, lipids, as in triglyceride here, uh, or proteins or anything, those are fuels. They're what provide you with energy. And oxidation is just the reaction that is happening here. I'm sure you guys know what oxidation is. We need the oxygen in this reaction in order to break down the fuel into our products. And so in fuel oxidation, the products are usually carbon dioxide and water. So oxygen is used, carbon dioxide is produced. Now, here we have a cell. And we. one thing to note is that the these all these reactions that we're talking about, they're compartmentalized. So think of a cell as like a house with rooms and each room, there's a different thing, different process going on. And so all different parts of the cell undergo different kind of reactions. So the mitochondria, you have oxidation of carbohydrates and fatty acids and all of that. While in the cytoplasm, you have mostly anabolic reactions, like synthesizing molecules. Um, and then you have other organelles like ribosomes where you're making proteins. So different parts of the cell are responsible for different reactions and parts of metabolism, all right? Now, is do you guys think that cells can choose which fuel they can use out of sugars and proteins and lipids? Because some cells are capable of choosing that. Now, I like to think of this as there are picky eaters or cells that are picky eaters and cells that are non-picky eaters. So the picky eaters choose a particular uh, fuel or substrate and they only or mainly or, or exclusively stick with that one. Like here, what do we have? Red blood cells and neurons. So red blood cells and neurons or brain cells, they mostly depend on glucose rather than fatty acids or amino acids, they depend on glucose. While the non-picky eaters, they're okay with anything, they're not picky, they're flexible with glucose, fatty acids, amino acids, depending on what's available. And that includes hepatocytes or liver cells and muscle cells. Now, one thing to note though, is we said these picky eater cells, they depend mainly on glucose, but red blood cells depend only on glucose, exclusively on glucose. They cannot utilize fatty acids or um, amino acids or proteins or anything like that. Do any of you have any idea why? Why can red blood cells only use glucose? It's like something with, they don't have mitochondria. Yes, perfect, exactly. So uh, red blood cells do not have mitochondria. They only have 
just the cytoplasm. So they cannot carry out the reactions which are required in order to use amino acids and fatty acids and all of that. They don't have those enzymes because they don't have mitochondria. And those processes take place in mitochondria. So they can only use glucose. So obviously, if they can use glucose, that means the, the breakdown of glucose to produce energy happens in the cytoplasm. So that is why red blood cells can only utilize glucose. Is that clear? Any questions? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. So now a metabolic pathway is a sequence of reactions. That is what a metabolic pathway means. Now these reactions in a metabolic pathway can be one of these things, reversible, irreversible, and regulated. Now reversible and irreversible, it's pretty straightforward. So if the reaction can go from reactants to products, as well as backwards from products to reactants, it's a reversible reaction. And so reversible reactions, the enzyme has to be capable of going both ways. But an irreversible reaction is opposite of that. It cannot go backwards. It can only go from the reactants to the product because the enzyme cannot undergo the backward reaction. You'd require another enzyme. So pretty simple. Now, regulated means that it's being, the activity of the enzyme can be altered in certain ways in order to control how much products are produced or how much you're consuming the reactants. So this regulation happens in three ways, all right? So these three ways of regulating a metabolic pathway are number one, you either adjust the amount of the enzyme or you covalently regulate the enzyme or you regulate it via an allosteric molecule, okay? So first, adjusting amount, pretty simple and straightforward you can decrease the amount of enzyme or increase it, okay? So you have however many enzymes you have and you can decrease its, its synthesis or increase its degradation and vice versa. You can also do the opposite. And this happens with at the gene level expression. So you go back to the uh, transcription of the genes that are, are making the enzymes. Just remember, enzymes are proteins. So this would be more of a long-term sort of alteration, okay? You're decreasing, you're changing the, num the, the number of enzyme molecules that are present. And so this obviously will regulate, it'll cause an effect on how the reaction is carried, the rate at the rich, which the reaction is carried out. So this is a way you regulate it. The second way is by a covalent regulation. Now covalent, I'm sure you guys know this from high school, covalent is just a type of bond that chemicals can make. And so one of these bonds is a bond with a phosphate group. So you can either phosphorylate the enzyme or dephosphorylate it, okay? So you can take put on a phosphate or take off a phosphate. And depending on the enzyme, this will have a different effect. So maybe a phosphorylated form is active. Maybe for some enzymes, a dephosphorylated form is active. So this is a, a spe specific to each enzyme, but the main idea is that this is a covalent type of regulation. And so when you see in, an, in a reaction that there's a kinase enzyme, kinase is the enzyme which phosphorylates um, molecules. So you should know that, oh, may maybe there's some um, regulation happening here. Okay. Now the third one is the allosteric regulation. And I'm sure you guys also already know this from just simple, like basic enzyme concepts that an allosteric molecule is one which will bind to an enzyme at the site other than its active site. So not at the active site, as you can see here, it's bound to somewhere else on the molecule. And it causes a change in the molecule, which will then uh, create a regulation. So it can either inhib uh, stop it from being able to bind to its substrate or making it bind more to its substrate, depending. So that was a simple way uh, to visually explain these concepts. So to go over them again with the details is that amount you're changing, rate of synthesis or degradation, and it's more long-term because you're changing it at the gene level expression. You're either decreasing uh, the synthesis or increasing it. And covalent re regulation, again, is either via phosphorylation, which happens via protein kinase enzyme. A kinase is one which phosphorylates, this is important, and, or a dephosphorylation reaction, which is via the opposite, a protein phosphatase. So these are two terms that you're going to hear a lot going from here on out because these there are many enzymes which are kinases and phosphatases that are very important in the regulation of metabolic pathways. Okay. Now, finally, allosteric. So again, an effector molecule binding to a site that other than the enzyme's active site. And so 
there are two types, like allosteric activators, which would then enhance the enzyme's activity, or allosteric inhibitors, which would then inhibit the enzyme's activity or decrease it. Now, allosteric regulations are an example of uh, feedback from downstream products. What this means is when you have a series of reactions and one of the re uh, products later on will allosterically inhibit one of the enzymes earlier on. We will touch up upon this in a minute. Or it could be a feed forward from upstream substrates. So upstream substrates can feed reaction forward via a different process. Again, we will uh, um, explain this more. But the main idea is that you have metabolic pathways with reactions. They can be regulated depending on the enzyme or the method of regulation, which we have just discussed. All good. You can stop me again if you have any questions. But if you don't, let us continue. Now, feedback inhibition. So what feedback inhibition is, you have these the series of reactions going from A to B to C to D to E. And each of these is catalyzed by an enzyme, right? So when you have feedback inhibition is when one of the products later on feeds back into the beginning of the uh, reaction and inhibits the enzyme there. It's simply just the a product inhibiting an enzyme earlier on in the reaction. And this is feedback inhibition, okay? Now, Obviously, when the product uh, is needed, then there will not be inhibition. But when you have too much of the product, it will inhibit the pathway, and that pathway will um, produce less of the product E. Now, one important point to note is that ATP, which we we've been we started the lecture with, ATP is the most important feedback inhibitor when it comes to catabolic pathways, which are the producers of ATP. So obviously, when ATP is low, do you think, do you guys think catabolism or the catabolic reactions are going to increase or decrease when ATP is low? It will increase. It will increase because you need more ATP. So obviously, you're going to stimulate the catabolic pathway to produce more ATP. And the uh, vice versa, when ATP is too high, you inhibit it. So ATP goes and inhibits the reaction itself. So this is feedback inhibition. Now, again, if we're saying this about ATP, what about AD, ADP and AMP? They're the products. So if you have high ADP and AMP, that means you're, you're breaking down a lot of ATP. And so it's going to do the opposite of what ATP would do. So when ATP is high, you would inhibit the pathway. But when ADP and AMP, the products are high, you would stimulate the pathway to produce more ATP. So it's just simply that they're acting opposite to each other in terms of regulation. Now, one more thing is the rate limiting step. A rate limiting is from the name. It's gonna, it's the step which will limit the rate at which the rest of the pathway happens. So it's a very important step usually in metabolic pathways. And it is very highly regulated. That is how you're able, yes? Sorry, uh, I have a doubt uh, that ATP is the most important. Uh, this cat, can you listen to me? Yes, yes, I can. Hello, hear. can you listen? To me? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, you said ATP is the most important inhibitor. Okay. Yes. And ADP and AMP are like stimulators, right? In terms of they just act opposite. They're not always stimulators. They can also, when they're they're too high, they can inhibit the path, some certain pathways from happening to stop the uh, breakdown of ATP. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Is that clear? Yes, yes. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, of course. Now, uh, yeah, a rate limiting step is highly regulated, and it's it provide it provides a very important function in only that specific pathway that it's in. It's usually also the committed step. Now, does anyone know what a committed step is? Um, that if if that step happens, you cannot like you have to continue the reaction. Yes. Exactly. So once you reach the committed step and it happens, you can't go back and undo that reaction. Like you have to fulfill the rest of the pathway. So that's why it's committed. It's committed to continuing the pathway. Now, uh, rate limiting is usually irreversible as well as the committed step. So um, one more thing to note is that that committed step, when the regulation of that committed step ensures that 
only the substrate of the pathway will accumulate when the regulated enzyme is inhibited. So not all the other molecules uh, accumulate, it's just the substrate of that pathway to accumulate when it's inhibited. Now, let's do a little practice question. I'm sure you guys have seen this question before, it was in your lecture, but which of the following enzymes catalyzes the committed step for the pathway leading to the formation of product six? C. Anyone else, you guys agree? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's C. Um, because if you see here, going from uh, molecule two to molecule four, molecule four will end up in the pro in the metabolic pathway uh, leading to the production of six. So this would be the committed step because the first uh, or enzyme A is not the committed step because the product two can uh, can either become three or four, right? And B is not the committed step, obviously, because you want to make product six and you can't make product six from that. And C would be the pathway, uh, the committed step, because that is the first reaction, which ensures that you end up in that pathway. So pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Now, you don't need to worry about this too much. Like this is just an overview of generally like homeostasis and hormones. So homeostasis needs to be maintained at two levels, okay? the self-preservation of each cell. So cells have their own needs and requirements and um, what energy they need and uh, the ions they need and the nutrients and the enzymes and all of that. So it can happen at the cell cellular level and uh, also to respond to external challenges such as like toxic levels of heat or oxidants. So you need homeostasis pretty much maintain these things in balance. Now, the most important is the maintenance of ATP concentration in homeostasis. Again, ATP, we keep talking about ATP. ATP is really important. Your Half of your mole one course is about ATP and its production, consumption, and all of that. So again, you need to maintain ATP. Why? As we just said, as we said earlier, ATP is really important to drive important metabolic pathways and reactions and your muscles contraction, your movement, your neurons firing, all of that. ATP is just important in general. So you need it to, in order to undergo all of these processes and it needs to be maintained via homeostasis. Now, it, homeostasis happens at two levels, at the level of the cell, so more of like a micro level and the level of the organism or you, your whole self, your whole body. So at the level of the cell or the micro uh, level, you have certain adaptive responses where the cell adapts when there is a decrease in ATP for whatever uh, reason. So these adaptive responses range from increased nutrient transport. So you start uh, transporting more nutrients in, in order to make more ATP, or you start breaking down the stored sources of ATP, such as glycogen and other energy reserves, and you have you obviously will activate ATP producing catabolic pathways and you will inhibit the ATP consuming biosynthetic pathways. So if you think about it, this whole, this metabolism part of the lecture is very straightforward and like logical. You just need to understand the basics and make sure you have a really good understanding of, of those because if you don't, then you won't be able to really understand any of the future lectures coming up. So make sure you get these things, these very basic core concepts straight. All right, now, uh, at the level of the whole organism or the macro uh, level, when you have, for example, you eat a meal that is full of carbohydrates, like you eat a sandwich or whatever it is, um, you will obviously have start to have a lot of glucose in your blood after it's digested. Now, too much of anything is bad, obviously. You wouldn't want all of that glucose in your blood. You don't want it to accumulate because then uh, this can have very bad effects on your body that we don't we are not going to go into so you have the cells themselves will have to respond to the situation and you will start taking the the glucose from the blood and into the cells and so when they're in the cells the cells will start to break down the glucose and use it for to make energy or they will take the glucose and build it up into a bigger molecule or complex molecule like glycogen so you need to take, basically, you need to take it into cells, okay? And the, does anyone know who is the, the player, the character, which takes, makes glucose go into cells? It's a hormone, if you need a hint. Insulin? Sorry? Yes, 
It's insulin. So um, insulin, when you have glucose in your blood, insulin will make it go into your cells. Simple as that. And the opposite is true for glucagon, the other hormone, which uh, releases glucose into your blood when you're fasting so that other parts of your body can utilize it. Now, um, how are these homeostatic challenges like decrease of ATP, increase of ATP or increase of glucose in your blood or decrease of glucose in your blood? How are they coordinated? One of you already mentioned insulin. So what, what is insulin? What are the, what's the main um, umbrella name for insulin and glucagon and all of these? Okay, they're hormones. Um, oh, I get how that could have been like a little bit confusing question. But all of these things that happen in your body that pose a homeostatic challenge, if it's too much or too less of something, these um, the organism deals with it by a, a system of coordination via hormones. So hormones are a very big player in metabolism. They're very, very important. Now, the hormones that we're going to discuss are mainly insulin, glucagon, and epinephrine. So insulin, as your friend just said, it's released when you have a lot of glucose in your blood, which happens when you eat a carbohydrate rich meal. And what it does is it causes glucose to enter the cells and causes it to be used for what for energy or to break it down. Now, glucagon does the opposite. It's released when you have too little glucose in your blood. And so it release, releases uh, glucose into your blood and tries to maintain that adequate blood glucose level. So this happens when you're fasting, of course. And epinephrine, which is like the friend of glucagon, glucagon and epinephrine, they work together or they help each other out. So epinephrine um, also tries to increase glucose levels in your blood. And this it's released when you are having, um, when you're stressed out and uh, you, need to, you, need, you, you need to use up more of that glucose because of the stress that you're experiencing. So this picture, I've probably seen it like 20 times at this point, you even see it in second year, like it's a very basic concept that, again, it's a core principle that you need to understand for many other things uh, at, in medicine. And it's a very important idea as well in, when, in terms of uh, certain diseases and clinical conditions. So um, remember that you're studying this for a reason. So insulin is using, causing glucose to enter cells and be used up when you have it in your um, blood, while glucagon and epinephrine are doing the opposite. So this is called the counter-regulatory response. Okay, now, how's, how's it going so far? Is everyone okay? Yes. Okay, no questions? Yes. Again, you can ask me anytime. So if no questions, let's continue to the important big part of our uh, uh, PAL, which is the next two lectures, okay? Now, remember this little diagram that I showed you earlier, glycolysis is the beginning of cellular respiration, which is a part of metabolism as a whole. So this is where you start, you start with glycolysis. Now, glycolysis by its name, now a little tip before in, any, in medicine in general, it's really helpful to understand the etymology or the, the meaning behind the name. So, Glycolysis means sugar breakdown. So when you understand this, you can understand any term that you encounter later on in medicine. It's really important to know these basic terms so you can understand it without having to memorize it. So glycolysis, sugar breakdown. So you're breaking down sugar. Okay, to release energy, obviously. So it's a process by which glucose, which is a six carbon molecule, six carbon means that there are six carbon molecules in one molecule, of glucose, um, six carbon atoms in one molecule of glucose. So the glucose is broken down to two pyruvate, which are three carbon. So you basically broke glucose in half, but there are a lot of intermediates between them. So it's not that simple, but yeah, you have, you start with a six carbon glucose, you end up with two molecules of pyruvate, which are three carbons. And in the process, you produce ATP, which is the purpose of glycolysis. You go through this entire pathway just to make some ATP, okay? So here is the um, diagram I'll be using to explain the reactions going on in glycolysis. I know it looks very confusing uh, or it looks like overwhelming because there are like 10 reactions, all these enzymes and, and you're using ATP or making ATP and all of this. Don't worry, guys, I'm going to break down every single step 
make sure it's clear for all of you. And again, you can ask me when you don't understand anything. And I found this diagram to be uh, pre uh, much more helpful than the others I found. So, or I found it to be the clearest. So we'll break it down. So don't worry, this is just the big picture. Now, before we get into the little, uh, every little detail, let's get the general facts straight. These are the most important things you need to take out of this lecture. That number one, glycolysis happens where? In the cytoplasm. So again, glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm. And if you remember earlier on, we said glucose is the only fuel that red blood cells can make because they don't have mitochondria, they only have cytoplasm. So glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm. That is why red blood cells can undergo glycolysis. So when you, when you see that little uh, rectangle saying high yield, by the way, it means that this fact is high yield. It can be asked about, uh, it might've been asked about, I'm not sure if you guys had a TBL covering glycolysis, but it's likely to be asked about on a TBL in any sort of question. Like they can give you a long um, scenario and then go like, uh, uh, why can red blood cells um, only undergo glycolysis? Because of, it happens in the cytoplasm. It's very important, very basic. Now you start with one glucose, six carbon, you end with two pyruvate, three carbons. Okay, now byproducts, you have the, uh, the production of two ATP, net means overall, and two NADH, or uh, you don't need to know the full form, just two NADH, which was uh, one of the coenzymes which are involved. So this is a big picture, the facts, the main, the main points, but we will go through every single step from glu glucose to pyruvate. All right, let's begin. So glycolysis has 10 steps, but the most important ones are steps one, three, and 10. These uh, are very stressed upon in your lecture. So they are in like truly very high yield. And the reason why they are so important is because they are the regulated irreversible steps. Okay. So you, I'm going to explain the entire process because I think you need to understand every rea reaction to understand the important ones. You can't just jump from one, three, and 10, that's it. I think it gives you a really good uh, full understanding of glycosis as a whole and not just like the main things. However, focus on the main things. But I'm gonna mention every, every step for the sake of understanding. Now, again, you start with glucose. Glucose, as we said, is a six carbon molecule. Now here you have these six hexagons, which are just representing carbons. So you have carbon, 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 carbon. This is obviously not the actual um, structure of glucose. It's just one hexagon, but I used it in order to just visualize six carbons so you can remember that they're six. Now it's a hydrophilic molecule, meaning what? What does hydrophilic mean? Water like Water loving. Yes. So it likes water and it's, um, polar, it's attracted to charged molecules. Now, can, do you think, this is a membrane, obviously, do you think the glucose can pass through the membrane being just without anything? No. No, because it's hydrophilic and the membrane has, um, uh, is hydrophobic. The center of the, the, the phospholipid membrane is hydrophobic, so it's obviously not gonna be able to enter purely without anything, just straight through the, the membrane. So it cannot enter by simple diffusion. It needs a different type of transportation, which is via facilitated diffusion. So facilitated diffusion, again, is a type of diffusion where you have a membrane transporter. So there is a, it's pretty much a gate through the membrane, a door, without having to deal with the hydrophobic phospholipids. It just get, it provides a gate or a door straight through the membrane. So this is called facilitated diffusion. And the, the membrane transporters that we have for glucose are called blood transporters or glucose transporters. So from now on, I'm just gonna be referring to them as blood transporters. So these blood transporters have various types. You have GLUT1, GLUT2, GLUT3, and GLUT4. Uh, I'll describe each one of them. Uh, so GLUT1 is present or expressed in most tissues of your body and most cells. And its, fun its function is just simply glucose uptake. GLUT2 is found in liver cells, intestinal cells, and pancreatic beta cells. And its function is high capacity glucose uptake. Don't worry about that too much. GLUT3 is found in the brain. And GLUT4 is found in muscles, adipose or fat, 
and the heart. Now, the reason I mentioned this is because, first of all, it's in your lecture, and I think this table is pretty important. But the most important part of the table is the final line. Blood four is expressed in muscle adipose and heart, and its function is insulin dependent glucose uptake. What this means is that the blood transporter will be available to or open or expressed to transport glucose when insulin is present. And when did we say insulin was present? When you have a lot of glucose in your blood. So it's dependent on the insulin that is released when you eat a, a carbohydrate rich meal. Only then does it is it expressed in these cells of the muscle, the adipose and the heart in order to take up glucose. Now, again, to reiterate, insulin wants, this is just a reminder, these boxes are just there to remind you that uh, insulin wants to get glucose out of the blood and into cells, okay? So, and this is high yield, this is a very important uh, uh, concept to remember because they can ask you about it. Now, the way, how, how, could a transporter be dependent on a hormone? So let me explain this. So usually, so you have these glucose carriers, which are glut transporters. Glucose carriers in this diagram are just the glut transporters. They're usually kept or stored in these ves vesicles inside the cell, okay? So they're just stored there, they're lying there waiting to be used when insulin comes and binds. So insulin binds, okay, insulin comes and binds to the cell, as you can see in the receptor here. And this causes a, a cascade of reactions, which will result in these gut transporters being added to the membrane. So now you're taking the gut transporter and putting it in the membrane, which provides the gate for glucose to enter the cell. So insulin, it is dependent on insulin. So only when insulin comes and binds, do you add, add these gut transporters to the membrane, making it insulin dependent, and then you can use up the glucose, All right, okay? So here is everything I just said in word form, because I know you guys like, to have it written down. And don't worry, I will have my explanations written down in my, if not in the slides, in the notes section once I share the slides with you. Now, again, this is glucose's journey. Now I, I added these diagrams because I don't want you guys to miss anything, even though it's not that it's not important um, or high yield. It's it was in your lecture and I don't want to you guys to miss anything. So again, this, this was in your lecture. You have glucose, it, it enters, um, it enters the cells and it's used there. But it's important to note that the liver plays a huge major role in glucose metabolism. You will learn all about that later on. It's just a note, liver is important when you think about glucose because there you have conversion of glucose to glycogen. A lot of glycogen is stored there. You can break down glycogen to glucose, all of that. So just keep in mind liver. And again, a reminder of the big picture to not get lost in those little things about um, uh, glycosis. The ATP is generated from all types of fuels in the body. And so the respiration, you have glucose and fatty acids and amino acids. And our lecture is just about that little red rectangle. That is the whole, um, the entirety of the glycolysis process is just that bit of the big picture. So I don't want you guys to lose um, sight of that, just a reminder. And again, glycolysis only produces a very small proportion of the ATP our cells need. So there are many other processes in making ATP, glycolysis just one of them. Now, let's begin with step one. We have, we end, uh, the glucose has entered the cell. Now what? Okay, so the first step of glycolysis is glucose, the trapping of glucose. You don't want to lose that glucose. If it just entered through the, the glut transporter, it can just leave again through the glut transporter. There's nothing stopping it except the first step of glycolysis, which is what is stopping it. So glucose will be phosphorylated into glucose 6-phosphate. So you can see here, I wish I had a pointer right now, but I couldn't uh, find a way to activate it. Um, sorry. So you have glucose, the six rectangles or the six carbons, and then it is phosphorylated and you end up with those six carbons with that yellow phosphate circle. So this means it's glucose six phosphate. Six phosphate means it's on the sixth carbon. The phosphate is on six carbon. Simple enough. So um, the where does this phosphate come from? You, when you have a phosphorylation reaction, you always need a source of that phosphate. Phosphates are not just like just lying around. So the, the phosphate we use is from ATP. So ATP provides the pho first phosphate um, in the first step of, gluco uh, of glycolysis. So you take the, the ph phosphate off of ATP, making it ADP, 
and you put that phosphate onto the glucose, making glucose 6-phosphate. And this will trap glucose because glucose 6-phosphate cannot leave through the GLUT transporter. The GLUT transporter is only for glucose. It cannot transport glucose 6-phosphate. So now glucose 6-phosphate is stuck in the cell and it has to undergo glycolysis. So look at that little post-it note on the top left corner. The reason I put it there is to keep track of when we use ATP what, or, uh, or when we use NAD, when we have, we have all of this, uh, all of these molecules being used and made. So to keep a little note of them in order to calculate the, to the total outcome, keep that in mind at the top left corner. Now, the enzyme which undergoes this glucose trapping, there are two kinds of enzymes. You have hexokinase, which is present in most tissues. That's why it's the one in this diagram. But you also have glucokinase, which is present in the liver and the pancreas. So the reaction is, again, a transfer of phosphate from ATP to glucose. And the reason why it's done is to keep glucose inside the cell, to keep uh, to trap it and not let it diffuse out through blood transporters. So here, again, it's a visual aid. You have phosphate, which means no exit, which means trapping. And when you see this uh, stop sign or, or negative sign in red down here, this is an inhibitor. Uh, or something that inhibits that enzyme. So an inhibitor of this enzyme is glucose 6-phosphate. This is the end pro the product inhibiting the enzyme itself. So when you have too much glucose 6-phosphate, logically, you're trapping a lot of glucose 6-phosphate. You wouldn't want to trap even more. Like it's enough, when it's enough, when it's too high, it will start inhibiting the enzyme hexokinase from phosphorylating more glucose. Now, we need to talk more about these enzymes, hexokinase and glucokinase. Now we said the one in the liver and the pancreas is glucokinase. So let's talk more about it. In the liver, glucokinase is again induced by insulin. Insulin will induce its expression and synthesis. Um, and this will lead to phosphorylation of glucose, as we just said, so you have more glucose 6-phosphate. And the purpose of this is to take the glucose from the blood and trap it inside cells in order to use it. So this will reduce hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia is too much glucose in blood. So this is a way to reduce it. This is why the liver is also important in glucose metabolism. While in the beta cells of the pancreas, there are certain there, there are a certain type of cells in the pancreas, this glucokinase will act as a blood glucose sensor. So when there's, again, hyperglycemia, when there's too much glucose in the blood, um, the glucokinase will phosphorylate it and it will sense that, oh, there's so much glucose that I'm phosphorylating. So therefore it will release insulin. That's where insulin comes from, beta cells, okay? Now, uh, an important thing to know here, again, um, these little boxes, this one is for uh, anything clinical that was mentioned. We have a disease uh, or an illness called maturity onset diabetes of the young type two or MUDI type two. It's a rare form of diabetes in which there's a mutation in this glucokinase. So you're unable to phosphorylate the glucose and it's unable to sense the, that, um, uh, the blood glucose is too high, and so it's unable to release insulin, as we just said in the pancreas. You can't really uh, secrete insulin, therefore you have hyperglycemia because you can't control it, you can't regulate it. So this will lead to hyperglycemia, leading to MODI type 2, which is maturity onset diabetes of the young type 2. Is this clear? Okay. Yes. Let's differentiate a little bit with, between glucokinase and hexokinase. So again, hexokinase is in most tissues, glucokinase is in the liver and pancreas. Hexokinase, now I'm gonna take you guys back to like the basics of enzyme kinetics, um, which you guys probably took in high school and already kind of know about, but just as a refresher, there are two of them, KM or michaelis minton constant and Vmax. Uh, KM is just pretty much a measure of affinity of the enzyme to the substrate. So when uh, K, the, the, the lower the KM, the higher the affinity. And so the KM is just the representation of the uh, substrate concentration at half of the Vmax. Vmax is the maximum rate of the, um, the enzyme's reaction. So the higher the Vmax, the greater the rate of the reaction, and the lower the KM, the greater the affinity, okay? So hexokinase has a lower KM, meaning a higher affinity. And glucokinase has a higher KM, which means a lower affinity to glucose. Now, hexokinase has a lower Vmax, meaning a lower maximum capacity, uh, uh, rate, but glucokinase is a much higher uh, maximum rate. 
Hexokinase is inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate, as we mentioned earlier, while glucokinase, as we also mentioned just here, is activated by insulin. So again, this is just the, the kinetics of glucokinase and hexokinase. Glucokinase is the red line. You have Vmax, which is the, the top uh, uh, maximum rate, and the Km, which is on the x-axis, which shows you the, the substrate concentration, in this case glucose, at which it is half of Vmax. While hexokinase is the blue line, which clearly shows you a lower Vmax and a um, as well as a lower Km, meaning it has a higher affinity. Is this clear to everyone? Do you need me to explain the kinetics anymore? All right, I'll take that as a no, and I'm going to continue. Now, step two is not a very important uh, step to remember. It's just there for you to understand the more important steps. It's uh, the conversion from, of glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, which is an isomerization reaction. Isomerization is just changing the form of what we have. It's not um, really chemically changing anything else. It's just the structure and form. So it's going from glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. You don't need to worry too much about the details. Now, here's where you need to worry about the details. So step three is the rate limiting and committed step. Again, when you see that rectangle with the high yield, it obviously means this is very high yield and important. And of course it is, since it's the rate limiting and committed step, which we defined earlier on in the lecture. So in this reaction, you're converting the fructose 6-phosphate, which if you remember, we, we produced from the last reaction, you're converting fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So fructose 1,6-bisphosphate means that you have now two phosphates instead of one. So this phosphate that we transferred comes from ATP. So again, in this reaction, we are using up a molecule of ATP or we are taking a phosphate away from it in order to use the energy. So uh, again, one ATP is used up. So you can see in that little post-it note at the top left corner, we have again minus one ATP. So, so far we have used two molecules of ATP. And uh, this produces fructose 1,6-bisphosphate as exemplified by the, the, the visual I added here with the six hexagons and two phosphates, as well as ADP and PI. Now, the enzyme here is where it gets important. It's, the enzyme is phosphofructokinase 1 or PFK1. So um, PFK1, is the enzyme that makes it rate limiting and committed. And we will talk uh, more about this. Now it is regulated by a, a multitude of these molecules. We have molecules that will upregulate it or, or increase its activity. And these molecules are AMP and fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. AMP will cause phosphofructose, uh, kin phosphofructokinase to increase its activity in order to make glycolysis happen uh, faster in order to produce ATP, because when AMP is high, you need to make more ATP. While fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate is very, very important, we're gonna talk about it in a second, but the inhibitors are ATP and citrate. Now, fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate, it sounds very similar to fructose 1, 6 bisphosphate, but it's different in that the phosphate is at a different molecule. And there, it's important to note that these two are very different, uh, uh, they have very different roles. So let's talk about fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate. So I want you to look at this diagram right here. Now, when you have, I know this looks very confusing. I'll try to explain it as simply as I can. When insulin is high, when it's released, when you, when again, when you eat a carbohydrate rich meal, you release insulin. Insulin will bind to a receptor and will activate uh, a number of enzymes. And one of the results of this is that you will have a decreased cyclic AMP uh, and decreased protein kinase A since you have cy uh, decreased cyclic AMP. So this decrease in active pro protein kinase A will result in the dephosphorylation. If you look here, it will result in the dephosphorylation of this bifunctional enzyme right here, which is PFK2 and FBP2. So it will result in the dephosphorylation of this bifunctional enzyme. When it's dephosphorylated, it is active. PFK2, when it's dephosphorylated, it's active. So PFK2 is phosphofructokinase 2, 
not one. That's different. That's the one that uh, catalyzes the reaction in the glycolysis pathway. This one is different. It's PFK number two. So we dephosphorylated it, made it active. And what PFK2 does is it converts fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, unlike PFK1, again, which converted fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So this PFK2 is making fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which is a, um, an activator of PFK1, okay? So the fructose 2,6-bisphosphate that is produced by PFK2 will then go on to activate PFK1. So this is a sort of indirect um, activation or regulation. Uh, again, I will go through it again. Insulin will cause uh, a decrease in the levels of cyclic AMP and protein kinase A. This decrease in these uh, two molecules will result in the dephosphorylation of PFK2, which is part of a bifunctional enzyme. PFK2 will convert fructose 6-phosphate to some of it to fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And this fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is a strong activator of PFK1, which is the enzyme in glycolysis. Okay? So when you have, when insulin is high, basically, zipda, is that when insulin is high, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate will be uh, uh, produced, which will activate PFK1. Is this clear to everyone? All right, I'll take that as a yes. Again, you can stop me if you guys have any questions. Um, so that's it. And uh, of course, if the, if insulin is having this effect, glucagon will simply have the opposite effect. Now, the fourth step is splitting fructose one and one six bisphosphate into glyceraldehyde uh, three phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Now, this split is splitting the two six carbon. Uh, it's splitting the six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules. So this is where you're starting to have the three carbon intermediates rather than uh, the six carbon that you had earlier. Uh, and the enzyme that does this is, you, again, you don't need to worry about this too much since it was not, it's not very high yield. It's just important so you can understand the rest of the glycolysis pathway. Step five is uh, I, the isomerization of dihydroxyacetone phosphate to glyceraldehyde three phosphate Again, not too important. It's just, uh, I'm adding it so that you can understand the rest of the pathway. So this will result in you having two molecules of glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So everything now on, everything from here on out in the glycolysis pathway is doubled because you have two molecules of glyceraldehyde three phosphate, okay? So, and they're three carbon, remember that. They're two separate molecules of a three carbon uh, um, chemical called glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So again, just a little checkpoint. Is everyone doing well? Is everyone okay with the concept so far? Uh, I'll check the chat just to make sure no one has any issues. Okay, so I'll take that as a yes and I'm gonna continue. Um, now, the sixth step is you have glyceraldehyde three phosphate that we had earlier on. You have two of those. That will be um, converted or oxidized to one three bisphosphoglycerate. Okay, two molecules of one three bisphosphoglycerate, one three BPG. But in the process, and for this reaction to happen, you need two molecules of NAD plus. NAD plus is a coenzyme which will, in, uh, if you guys remember from chemistry, uh, when you have an oxidation reaction, it is linked to a reduction reaction. So when oxidation happens, reduction has to happen to another uh, molecule. So here we're, we're trying to oxidize uh, glyceraldehyde three phosphate to 1,3-BPG. In order to oxidize it, we have to reduce something else. So the, the thing that we're reducing is NAD, the coenzyme NAD+, and it's reduced by transferring the hydrogen from the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate to the NAD, producing NADH. That's where the reduction comes in because you're adding the hydrogen. 
And in this diagram, I know it says reduced NAD, which is just NADH. Just keep that in mind because this is what the diagram had said. So now if you look at the, the post-it note on the top left corner, it says minus 2 NAD plus. So we've used 2 NAD plus, And of course, we have created 2 NADH. All right. And the enzyme that is involved in this is glyceraldehyde prephosphate dehydrogenase. Dehydrogenase from the name, it's taking away the hydrogen and giving it to NAD. It's as simple as that. And the reason why this happens is to produce the high energy intermediate 1,3 BPG. All right. And then we move on to the next step, which is step seven. Now we have 1,3 BPG. The 1,3 BPG will be converted to phosphoglycerate. And in the process, if you notice here, uh, one, you're going from 1,3 bisphosphoglycerate. That means two phosphates. There were two phosphates on this. You're going from that two phosphate molecule to a phosphoglycerate, meaning now it has one phosphate. So it lost a phosphate. Where did this phosphate go? It was transferred to ADP. And by this transfer of phosphate to ADP, you obviously have now ATP. And this, so this is the first step which creates ATP in the process of glycolysis. So, and this is via substrate level phosphorylation. That's why this is in, this is the process by which ATP is produced here. So if you, again, you look at the post-it note, you have now added to ATP, okay? So we've used two ATP, used up to ATP in the beginning of glycolysis, if you remember from the first few reactions. Now here we made two ATP. So at this point, there has been no change in overall uh, levels of ATP because you used two and now you created two. All right, then we have the next step. You're going from three phosphoglycerate to two phosphoglycerate. You don't need to worry about this uh, reaction uh, much. Then now uh, you're going from two phosphoglycerate to phosphoenol pyruvate. And the enzyme here is enolase. And what's important to note is that enolase, the enzyme that undergoes this reaction, is inhibited by the fluoride in toothpaste. So toothpaste contains a chemical called fluoride. This fluoride works by inhibiting enolase. And the reason why this makes your teeth cleaner <laughs> is because um, there's enolase in bacteria. So inhibiting enolase will stop bacteria from being able to carry out um, glycolysis or metabolism on their own. And so this will inhibit the um, growth of bacteria or kill bacteria, whatever it is, it will just keep your teeth cleaner. All right, now the final step, and it's the third important high yield step. As if you remember, we did, we, we said the first one, the third one, and the 10th one. So step 10, the last final step, which is also regulated and uh, irreversible is um, phosphoenol pyruvate to the final product, which is pyruvate. And in the process, you are also transferring the, the phosphate that is on phosphoenol pyruvate. You're transferring that phosphate to ADP, creating ATP. And again, since we, are, we have double of everything, there will be two molecules of ATP produced. And that is added to our little post-it note um, at the top left corner. Now you've created two more ATPs. And the enzyme here is pyruvate kinase. This reaction is a substrate level reaction once again, and it results in the production of the final product to pyruvate and also adds two ATPs to um, the molecules we've been using. Now, what's important to note about pyruvate kinase is you can have the deficiency of this enzyme. So pyruvate kinase deficiency will obviously lead to a decrease in ATP generation because you're, um, the step directly creates ATP. So you have a decrease in ATP generation, uh, pretty straightforward. And it's a, 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 it can have several effects, one of them being that you are unable to maintain sodium potassium kin uh, sodium potassium ATPase, which is the channel that uh, you it requires ATP in order to transport sodium and potassium across the membrane. And so once you have low ATP because of pyruvic kinase deficiency, you're unable to maintain that, that channel um, and you need to be able to, to transport sodium and potassium. They're very important to maintaining the cell, maintaining the membrane, maintaining all of that. And so this will have a huge effect on red blood cells, which will cause it to swell and eventually lyse or um, sort of explode. And this lysis of red blood cells, we call it hemolytic anemia. So here, this is what it sort of looks like under a microscope. And um, 
it's basically as just dysfunction of the sodium potassium HPA's channel as a result of pyruvate kinase deficiency because you can't make any more ATP. You cannot uh, maintain this channel anymore, which leads to an inability to uh, transport sodium and potassium, which will highly affect red blood cells. Now, can anyone uh, answer me with this question? Why is this mostly impacting red blood cells? Okay, so the reason why it's supposed to impacting red blood cells is because red blood cells rely on the process of glycolysis to produce energy. And so if you can't, if there's anything wrong with the process of glycolysis, you're going to impact red blood cells mostly because most cells have other ways of making ATP and there are other ways to maintain their channels. So this is why you have RBC swelling and hemolytic anemia. Now, um, when you compare it to a different kind of uh, deficiency, enzyme deficiency, which is glucose 6-phosphate, if you uh, dehydrogenase, this must have been um, either taught to you in a different lecture or it will be taught to you in a future lecture, but this is not one of the objectives of this pal. So this will, uh, in comparison to that, you don't see any Heinz bodies, which are uh, sort of like these inclusions inside these cells as a result of, result of G6PD deficiency. And so that is not present here in, in uh, pyruvate kinase, so it's a differentiating factor. And then finally, you have an increase in 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate or BPG and other glycolytic intermediates. So obviously, if you have a deficiency in the final uh, step here, all of the intermediates that come before it are gonna start accumulating because they can't, they can't continue on to become pyruvate, so they're gonna start accumulating. And so when you have an accumulation of all of these, including 2,3-BPG, it's gonna start affecting hemoglobin. Uh, that is inside the red blood cells, it will change its affinity to oxygen. It will, by increase or sorry, decreasing its affinity to oxygen, meaning that it's simply just going to carry less oxygen. And I'm sure you guys remember from CVP how this affects um, oxygen transport in your body. Now, again, and now finally, uh, just to reiterate, three regulated steps in glycolysis are very important. Steps one, three, and 10. They are regulated. Uh, they're Enzymes that are regulated are hexokinase, phosphofructokinase 1, and pyruvate kinase. Now that is the process of glycolysis. And those three steps or high yield steps I want you guys to focus on and because they are the ones that are regulated and um, uh, most important ones, they're regulated by hormones, as we mentioned earlier, hormones being insulin and glucagon. So insulin is going to up regulate or activate or enhance the activity of those three steps or enzymes because again, insulin wants to utilize the glucose. It wants to decrease the glucose in your blood. It wants your cells to use it. So it's gonna upregulate the process of glycolysis. Well, glu glucagon is gonna do the opposite effect by um, uh, decreasing the activity of all of these enzymes because you want to um, keep the glucose in the blood. You don't want to use it or oxidize it or break it down. So once you understand the, that the basic role of insulin and glucagon, you can link any of these things together. Uh, any questions so far? All right, perfect. Now, if you guys remember the post-it note that I had up here, we said we, we started with using ATP and then we used another ATP and then we used two NAD pluses and produced two NADH and we produced two ATP and then two ATP. So the overall, how much ATP in total, in total, have we created? Two. You cre exactly, perfect. You have resulted in creating two ATP because you used up two and you made four. So the net overall is created two ATP because uh, the, the two consumed and the two created canceled each other out. And that is um, shown here where you have minus one ATP, minus one ATP, and then two NADH, and then two ATP, two ATP. It's just pretty simple. Um, you end up with two ATP, that's it. Two AD, ATP and two NADH. Now, pyruvate. What happens to pyruvate after glycolysis is, is over? Pyruvate has multiple fates. It can either, or it has two fates. It can either, um, become ethanol or lactate when there is no oxygen uh, present, this process is called fermentation. So when there's no oxygen, it will go undergo fermentation. When there is oxygen present, it will, un it will continue the process of cellular res respiration that we talked about earlier um, via entering mitochondria. And this is where uh, Rafi is gonna take off tomorrow, inshallah, your next tutor um, that will explain to you 
what happens then to pyruvate in the mitochondria via the Krebs cycle and the ETC and everything. Now let's look, since that is not part of the objectives that's gonna be taught to you in later lectures, let's look at this part, which is when there is no oxygen present when in which fermentation happens. So when you don't have oxygen, it's called an anaerobic condition. So in anaerobic conditions, you're gonna, the, the cells are gonna pyruvate and ferment in a process of anaerobic respiration uh, in order to produce the, the, the product, which is lactate. So um, the reason why this would happen is number one, in red blood cells. So red blood cells, again, they don't have mitochondria. So obviously they cannot undergo the rest of cellular respiration, Krebs cycle and everything. So pyruvate is gonna end up being um, fermented or uh, undergo anaerobic glycolysis uh, in the end and make lactate in order to produce more ATP. So that's what happens in red blood cells. Another case is in skeletal muscle. When you're exercising vigorously, when there's a lot of muscle contraction happening, the skeletal muscle wants to produce more and more ATP really quickly. Um, and since, and you would think, okay, like why does it undergo the rest of cellular respiration and make all of that ATP via the oxygen? Well, it's because there's not enough oxygen to do that when you're exercising vigorously. Their oxygen becomes like a very limiting factor. So in order to keep going and make ATP, it will uh, turn the pyruvate into uh, lactate and via anaerobic glycolysis. Lastly, in ischemic tissues, ischemic just means like dead or, um, or lack of oxygen supply. And so the cells are dying. And so these cells, which lack oxygen supply, they will use anaerobic glycolysis to, for crisis management since they are dying. This allows them, this lets them survive just for some time to produce more glyco uh, ATP, ATP via glycolysis. However, one thing to note is that lactate, the product of anaerobic glycolysis, is um, fatal. It's not, it's, it's not good for you. So an accumulation of that in ischemic cells will lead to cell death. And uh, a clinical uh, situation is lactic acidosis. So when there's too much lactic or lactic acid produced, you will end up with lactic acidosis. And um, the most... It most commonly happens, like the acidosis most commonly happens when you have um, a problem of oxidative metabolism. So when there is a problem in any of the in these parts, which are uh, the oxidative um, or oxygen requiring parts of metabolism, when you have an issue here, it will lead to it might lead to lactic acidosis because you're not able to use pyruvate in that way. You end up making too much lactate. So. Um, whether there's respiratory failure, you don't have enough oxygen, whether there's an insufficient oxygen transport via red blood cells, or there's a toxin that is inhibiting a part of the oxidative pathways. All of these things will lead to um, lactic acid being produced too much because there's no other way for, there's no other path for pyruvate to take, it ends up making lactate, and this will lead to lactic acidosis. Um, now, finally, when you have lack of oxygen supply to tissues, which leads to tissue ischemia, phosphofructokinase 1 will, again, if you remember, is stimulated by what? By low energy or low uh, levels of ATP, or in other words, high AMP. And so PFK1 will be activated by these things or stimulated, and it will end up producing a large amount of lactate uh, formed by anaerobic glycolysis, because then glycolysis is upregulated. You keep making more and more pyruvate, and that pyruvate will then be converted to... Um, uh, lactate, which will end up in lactic acidosis. And this table is just the conditions that are resulting in it. They're not uh, like going to ask you anything specific here. It's just an I give you the idea of lactic acidosis uh, as a result of the accumulation of lactate. Now, one, one more thing is that um, the reason why uh, uh, fermentation happens in order to start is in order to reproduce the NAD plus that was required by the process of glycolysis. If you remember, you needed that NAD plus for the sixth reaction, I believe, if I'm not wrong. So in order to keep re regenerating that, that's one of the purposes of anaerobic glycolysis. If you see here, it's going from NADH to NAD plus so that NAD plus can be re uh, reused. So that's one, one thing to note. But however, in lactic acidosis, when you're, when it's happening too much, this um, uh, accumulation of, or sorry, when the mitochondria cannot ox oxidize NADH to NAD+, uh, uh, with a lack of oxygen, then 
there will this will also lead to an accumulation of NADH, making the um, lactate dehydrogenase reaction irreversible in the direction of lactate formation. So what this means is basically when you have low oxygen, the mitochondria cannot uh, reproduce NAD plus from NADH. And so if you cannot reproduce NAD plus from NADH, NADH will start accumulating. This accumulation of NADH will make this reaction here going from pyruvate to lactate irreversible. It will make it um, shift for, towards lactate uh, highly because you have a lot of NADH and you want to produce that and you want to regenerate the NAD plus from NADH. So it will keep making NAD plus and in the process will make too much lactate. So this is another aspect of lactate, lactic acidosis. Now, uh, I'm sure you guys are tired, uh, but one last question. I'm pretty sure I repeated the answer to this like a million times, but which of the following cells are solely reliant on glycolysis for ATP to maintain their surface active, um, their surface Active transport proteins. Sorry, not active transport. Which one of these cells? All right, that's fine. Um, I don't know if you guys are answering in the red in the chat, but I cannot see that right now. But the answer here is, of course, red blood cells. As I've mentioned time and time again, red blood cells lack mitochondria, so they can only carry out glycolysis because it takes place in the cytoplasm. Now, that's it for me. Uh, thank you so much, guys, uh, for, for joining in the first place since you know you just came out of CVP. I'm sure you guys are taking a break and um, you should, but uh, this, was, this was the end of my call session. If you have any questions at all, you feel free to ask me.